Allen. Welcome to the Presidential Distinguished Professors Lecture. Um, I'm so glad you can make it, rain and all. We know what rain does to Southern California. And also welcome to those of you on the live stream. Uh, we're also happy to have you here with us in the room today. Um, thank you for coming and I'd like to introduce the president of Cal State LA, uh, William Covino, who will then introduce our lecturer today. Wow, we have a crowd. That's good, it's great, it's great to see you all. Uh, this is my last one, actually, of these, uh, of these events, because uh, uh, I won't be here next year for it. And in honor of my time here at Cal State LA, actually this lecture is all about me, really. Uh, status, happiness, and bad behavior. Uh, so uh, we're gonna review all the bad behavior and uh, minimum, no, it's not, I'm just going on and on, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so this, uh, this award, the President's Distinguished Professor Award, is a very big deal at Cal State LA and has featured some of the most uh, wonderful and accomplished and transformational faculty that we have and have had here. It, represents, as many of you know, superlative teaching and exceptional commitment to students, uh, along with professional accomplishments and service and the whole package, right? Only those professors who have previously been selected as outstanding professors are eligible for this award, and that was 2011, I think, right? Outstanding professor, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, over the last decade, um, Steve has moved, moved uh, 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 even that much more uh, forward and, uh, and gotten this honor, which is a real tribute to what he's accomplished over uh, nearly a decade and beyond. Uh, many thanks to the Outstanding Professor Awards Committee uh, Cameron Afari, Elaine Draper, Heidi Riccio, Maria Bago, Holly Yu, and Patrick Crow, who's the chair of the committee. Uh, each distinguished professor recipient gives a lecture on the topic of their choice. And uh, our recipient this year is Professor Stephen J.J. McGuire, a professor of management in the College of Business and Economics, uh, who has served the college in a wide range of roles over as many years at the university, and uh, has published more than 150 papers in peer-reviewed journals and conference proceedings, and received more than 40 awards for research and teaching accomplishments. He's the, order, uh, the author of Managing Organizational Change and the editor of the Journal of Case Research and Inquiry, and as a manager, consultant, or educator, uh, Steve has worked in 26 countries. I imagine that's gonna rev up a little more now since probably a lull during COVID, right? So, so the plane is idling even as we speak. Uh, his extensive body of work uh, includes an examination of entrepreneurial organizational culture, teaching negotiation skills to MBAs, case studies, examining organizations that are facing business, ethical, and legal challenges, status and happiness, status and happiness and bad behavior is the focus of Steve's current research. And today, he will discuss this study on that relationship uh, between status, happiness, and good or bad behavior in the US, Mexico, Russia, Romania, and the Philippines. So it's gonna be a good journey, I think. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished colleague, Stephen McGuire. Thanks again for coming. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> so the topic is status, happiness, and bad behavior. But of course, it's about good behavior, too. Um, 
Business professors don't normally study this stuff. We normally study how to make money, how to increase market share, right, stuff like that. But uh, the topic is, is got me excited and I hope that you will uh, share my excitement a little bit on it. Uh, I'm going to begin uh, the, the talk with a little bit of my research stream. Then I'll go about the research question of the study. I'll tell you, tell you what I think status is what happiness is, the relationship between status and deviant behavior, the relationship between status and happiness. I'll then present hypotheses of the study, tell you what we found, I'll have some conclusions and some thoughts, and finally some future research, a few things that I think that we could do. Um, so let's begin with research stream. My research team I divided conveniently into three chunks. So there's a photo of me young and a photo of me not so young. Um, I started late, this is my second career. So I got my PhD at age 43 and I had to hurry to catch up to all the young whippersnappers uh, who were producing lots of papers. So goal number one in stage one was produce a lot of papers. Publish a lot of stuff so you get tenure, of course. Um, and what I was working on at that point was Culture and firm performance, the culture of an organization and the performance of a firm, uh, climate and patient safety, culture and entrepreneurship, managing change, things like that. So organizations developing good results because of who they were. So very businessy, very businessy stuff. In the second phase, I kind of evolved to examine student skills research with students, much more of a pedagogical focus. And I became very interested, for example, in how do you teach students how to negotiate? It's a really important skill. And, and how do you teach students how to do research and then doing research with students and eventually carrying that research out into the community? So we began writing case studies on companies like organizations like Homeboy Industries which as you know is our neighbor down the road, which takes ex-gang members and turns them into productive members of society who follow the rules. Um, in addition to that, there were a number of topics that I didn't start but my students did that I got very excited about, such as diversity training, such as, for example, biases in the workplace against women's, black women's hair which you may or may not know is a big problem. Such as, for example, bias in hiring against single mothers. Okay, which are topics that our students bring to us and if we nurture and encourage them, they can become papers, they can become publications, and they're really, really interesting. The third phase of my study, I guess it's working with Cal State LA people and international partners on life. So I've moved from how do you make money to how do you teach people to what matters in life, if you will. So this is characterized by some international studies, for example, a study on the good life in about 10 different countries and a study on happiness that I'm going to talk about today. So this is the evolution of my uh, career and my dean is out here and thinking, hmm, he's not studying how to make money. This is true. I have kind of moved away from that, but I promise some of the stuff in the first quadrant is still in the pipeline. So what are the research questions for the study today? Number one, the question is how does status influence behavior at work or in school? And we're talking about good behavior and bad behavior, right? What is that relationship? Second is how does status affect happiness? Now, why do we care about happiness? Well, intuitively, you all know that happy people will behave differently at work than miserable people. But, 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 we need to find a framework in order to study that. We need to find some evidence that that may be so. We need to put that into perspective so that we can use that finding in how we teach and how we manage. Okay, so that's where we're going. What is status? Well, obviously status varies in cultures. On the top left, you have a picture of a headman from Papua New Guinea, okay? This gentleman saves for a whole year in order to have a fabulous party 
where there's a feast for everyone he knows, gifts for everyone, and gains enormous prestige by having had the best party ever. Okay, you have, for example, castles in Europe representing aristocracy and years and years of wealth and prestige. You have a Japanese empress who is considered in her culture to be divine. Okay, you have down the bottom a, 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 a European nobleman with his furs and his jewelry showing to the world how important and impressive he is. You have a picture of a building that is actually the Ritz Carlton Moscow. At one point in time, not today, the most expensive hotel room in the world. I had the pleasure of entering the lobby. That's as far as I went. <laughs> I didn't go to the coffee shop or the bar, but I did go in the lobby, and it's very beautiful. That's the Ritz Carlton. Now, I did go to the next building, which is in the middle there. That is actually the Oxford Cambridge Club in London. So I went to the Oxford Cambridge Club. I was invited by Tony, my then boss. And I said, Tony, where did you study? Ha ha, Oxford or Cambridge? I thought it was funny. He says, both. I got my undergrad from Oxford. I got my grad from Cambridge. I said, OK. And it was really hot and stuffy. There's no air conditioning. So I got up to take off my jacket. You can't do that. So I sat and sweated throughout the entire meal at the Oxford Cambridge School. And on the bottom right, you have a dog. This is a dog of royalty. This is a corgi. You know the queen has these. But I also have one. So I decided that's my dog. I'll put a picture in the, uh, in the thing. <laughs> what is status? So status is the relative position within the hierarchy. And in the research, normally there are three types. Political status economic status and prestige status, and of course they overlap. So let me talk a little bit about status. Political status. Well, today is voting day. I voted. I hope everybody voted. Everybody who's illegally allowed to vote, voted. Um, and, and, and political status comes from power that's derived either through traditions of families running stuff, or in our case, elections to high office like our senators. So political status is one type of status. You have, of course, economic status. These on the picture are some of the wealthiest families in the world. Okay, We have the Carnegies and the tradition that they have of building up wealth for that family. We have the Walton family. Once Sam Walton was the wealthiest man in the world. He's been passed out. He was passed out by Jeff Bezos, who's also here. He was passed out by Elton Musk, who's not up on my picture. I didn't want his picture up there. Um, Warren Buffett, of course, is still around making very important comments about what taxes wealthy people should pay. What, how economic status should be leveraged for the good of society. Others up there perhaps are saying less about that. But for sure, status is derived from economic prosperity. In addition to that, you have signs of economic status. Here are two very nice red cars. One is a Bentley, one is a Toyota. They're nice and shiny and pretty, and both of them will get you from home to Cal State LA. If you pay for parking, as we all do, it's the same price to park a Bentley or to park a Toyota. Okay? Both of them will carry four people comfortably. <laughs> Both of them have a trunk where you can put your groceries. Right? They are, for all practical purposes, interchangeable. But one of them, when you drive it, it sends out a symbol. I have status. Please look at me. Please admire me as I drive by. We're going to see these cars again because they're very important in this presentation. There is prestige status. Prestige status means that people admire you because of who you are. That people defer to you. That people are attracted to you. In addition, People want to imitate you, and you play the role of influencer. You give people suggestions on what they should do, what they should buy, how they should act and behave. This is st 
status associated with prestige, the second type. We then have apparel status. Here are two nice shirts. I like them both. Matter of fact, I can't quite tell them apart. <laughs> however, however, one of them on the left is a Louis Vuitton. You have to pronounce it with the French accent, of course. <laughs> and the one on the right is a Michael Kors, and I think they're both lovely. However, the difference in price is quite remarkable. Now, what's obvious about the one on the left is if you look really carefully, it's a, maybe a little blurry, I have good eyes, you can see there's an L and a V in the pattern. So somebody wearing that is sending a message to the world. I have prestige. I am important. Look at me. Look how beautiful my shirt is. I was going to wear my Louis Vuitton for this presentation, but it was at the dry cleaner, so I had to wear this one here. <laughs> ah, university. Very, very, very obviously the university attended is a sign of prestige. And perhaps one that we can't get away from, one that matters to us all. And our obsession with rankings, with reputation is there. And prestige is very much associated with this. I have to, however, move from university to college of business so I can talk about stuff I know. Business schools have more or less prestige. And they're ranked. And you can go and buy a magazine with the rankings from number one to last of business schools. And you know what's remarkable? Is that the rankings have no relationship with the quality of the education. None. The most important, about 75% of the criteria for ranking of business schools are subjective assessments of prestige. They are placement rates. Did you get a job? Well, why'd you get a job? Because we thought you were good, so we went to hire you. It's a circle. They are dean's assessment of other business schools. And I gotta tell you, I suspect, please tell me if I'm wrong, that deans rate their own business schools really highly. <laughs> Whether it was good or not. They may go out and complain about their business school, it was awful, but when it comes to rating them, they're gonna rate them really highly. And finally, it is recruiter assessments. So, we have here a subjective assessment of prestige that has nothing to do with education, has nothing to do with quality, has nothing to do with learning. That is what exactly status is. It is a subjective perception of your rank within a hierarchy. Historically, prestige has been translated by people of status into expeditions. Charles I of Spain, for example, sponsored an expedition by a gentleman named, in English, Fernando, uh, Ferdinand Magellan, right, to navigate the world. He didn't make it, by the way, you do know that. He got stuck in the Philippines. If you've ever been to the Philippines, it's easy to get stuck there. People don't get out of there sometimes. <laughs> he got stuck in the Philippines and never made it home. However, this created for Charles this prestige that he has sponsored an exploration around the world. And this is a live day. As a matter of fact, the greatest status symbols in the world today have to do with the expedition sponsored by our elite. These are the elite, economically for sure, in some cases politically, they have clout through probably dark money. Some of it not so dark, right? They have political clout, they have economic clout, and they obviously have prestige, and they sponsor expeditions. These are the three expeditions to outer space, which will bring immediate prestige and potentially, but not automatically, long-term economic gain. It's not obvious that it will do so, but it may, it may. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for that status. So, that status. I hope I've explained to you my understanding of what it is. Let me talk about happiness. In the literature, in philosophy, and some of you will certainly know better than I, there are broadly speaking two types of happiness. One of them is hedonic happiness, which is normally the presence of pleasure and the absence of pain. It is notably short term. I had a good meal today. Okay, I enjoyed the Gloria Gaynor concert the other evening, which I did, by the way. Okay, 
I, uh, I, I had a, a lovely uh, cup of coffee, thank you very much, to keep me going. All of these things bring me pleasure, okay? They can be physical pleasure, it can be emotional pleasure, it can be romantic pleasure, all these things are pleasure. This is hedonic happiness, and it's very short term. It doesn't last, it doesn't last, but it can repeat. That's hedonic pleasure. Hedonic pleasure has been measured in some of the psychology research as life satisfaction and sometimes as subjective well-being. So these are different approaches to measuring hedonic happiness from the philosophy literature. The philosophy literature also talks about eudaimonic happiness, which is long-term accumulation of happiness as you move to becoming a self-actualized person, as you progress toward your goals, as you achieve things, and as you help other people, which, as we know, brings us happiness in the long run. So, these are the two types of happiness in literature. Now, of course, we have to operationalize this, right? So we're gonna measure constructs that are measurable as opposed to philosophical ideas that would be very hard to measure. So we're gonna bring it down a little bit to earth as we measure this happiness among our sample. Before that, though, it's interesting to look at the World Happiness Report. The 2022 report just came out, and what do we know? Why are people happy? It's just a great question before we dive into my research. Why are people happy per the World Happiness Report? Well, first, positive predictors include household income. People who don't have enough money to survive are not happy. And I think we get that. I think that we can accept that economic prosperity will lead to some type of happiness. I don't think we need to reject that. Um, second, the idea that you can count on friends. People who are friendless or cannot trust their friends are generally not happy. Third, freedom. That you can do what you want with your life, with your love, with your body, that you can do what you want, your freedom. And as all of us know here, academic freedom is something we prize very, very highly. That we can study what we want. Nobody tells us what to study and we value this so very, very highly. Donations are important. When people have a habit of giving to causes they care about, to charities that they value, they are happier. It's interesting. You give to charity, you get something in return. Long-term happiness. People who don't give to charity are less happy than people who do. So next time you're in Vons or Albertsons and there's the thing at the checkout, you wanna give $5 to this? Hit it. You'll be happier, I promise. You'll cost me $5 poorer, but you'll be happier. Age matters. I'm talking about age next. Age is so important to happiness. Gender matters. It turns out, I'm sorry to say, females in the world are happier than males in the world. Married men, it turns out, are happier than single or divorced men. But women, for whatever reason, don't seem to get happier if they're married or single. <laughs> That's the data. That's the data. Why that is so, I, I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> College educated people tend to be happier than those who haven't, which is a very good reason to increase our graduation rate right there. We'll it will increase the happiness in California if we graduate more people. And finally, the idea that you trust institutions. This is so relevant today. We all voted, right? You trust institutions, and that trust leads to happiness around the world. Negative predictors include health problems, right? You don't feel well. You're not so happy. Second, corruption. Third, marital status, okay? Divorced and single people are less happy unemployment and being foreign born, being an immigrant in whatever place you are around the world, uh, generally is associated with lower levels of happiness. So these are our predictors. And then we, of course, we have the results from the World Happiness Survey. And the happiest countries in the world tend to be clustered in Scandinavia, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Finland, Sweden, but also Canada, and also Australia. So that's where the happiest places are. The United States is happy, 
but not as happy as those other guys. So we got to pick up the pace here. There are some very, very unhappy places around the world. If you look at Europe, you'll notice that the orange cluster in there, I believe that's Ukraine. And I think we all know why, right? Okay. Happiness and age. The research is unequivocal that happiness changes over your lifetime. Children are generally happy, and then it dips. Age 39 is a disaster for most people. <laughs> it's a disaster. It's that point in your life when you say 40's around the corner, <laughs> right? I haven't got what I wanted, and it don't look like I'm gonna get it. <laughs> but good news is, around 45 it starts picking up. 50, 55, 60, and generally increases until the end of your life. Yeah. Okay, generally speaking, a 70-year-old is happier than a 50-year-old, generally speaking, on all places around the world. And that may be for a lot of reasons, one of which is you get used to what you have. You're happy with what you have and who you have at this point. Partly because you're not marketable anymore, that may be true, but, <laughs> but still, but still you accept what you have and it brings you happiness in all countries of the world. This curve changes slightly in different places, by the way. Some countries it's a little younger, some it's a little older. I always thought if we did one for only university people, that dip would be right before the tenure decision, you see? <laughs> so that's where it picks up. Research on status and bad behavior is fascinating. And the literature review has revealed a number of different things. So here are our cars again, the Bentley and the Toyota. So what do you think occurs when drivers of Bentleys and Toyotas are out there on the road? Who do you think stops for passengers? Who do you think follows the speed limit? Who do you think cuts off other drivers? It's the Bentley. Research indicates that higher priced cars follow the rules considerably less than modestly priced cars. Why? Well, I'm gonna to get to a theory that helps explain this, but in simple terms, the feeling of entitlement that status brings allows people to believe that sometimes the rules do not apply to them. They apply to everyone else but not to me, because I have a Bentley. Here's some research on candy. Subjects went in for a study. It had nothing to do with status, had nothing to do with any of this stuff. They just did a study. But on the way out of the study, they were told, thank you for participating. By the way, there's a jar of candy over there. It's for the children who are coming for the next study. But if you'd like a piece, you may take one. <laughs> and then the researchers leave. Now they come back later and count how many candies were taken. The higher the status on a survey, the more candies people took from that jar from the children. Lower status people took fewer candies or none at all. Higher status people, they're grabbing handfuls. Probably putting them in that little thing in the middle of the Bentley, probably, right? <laughs> Finally, status and bad behavior in recruitment. So this is an experimental design where people have a role play. So some role play the interviewer and some role play the interviewee. And the, the research is on the interviewer. The interviewee has standard answers. The interviewer gets a script. And in the script it says, by the way, the job you're hiring for is temporary. It's gonna go away in six months. The question, the research question is, who tells the interviewee it's a temporary job? Who misleads the interviewee by hinting that it's a permanent job? And who actually outright lies and says it is a permanent job? The higher the status, the more likely interviewers lied. Isn't this fascinating? So status results some situations in very bad behavior. Taking the candy from the children, lying to the interviewee, driving through the pedestrian walkway in your Bentley. This is bad behavior, okay. 
I was on an airplane not too long ago, maybe you were. I sat in the blue seats on the right. Of course, I wasn't in the front row, I was in the middle. I'm six foot two, which means my knees were jammed into my body, right? And I was very uncomfortable on the flight because I'm too tall for those cheap seats. But of course, you can't afford those expensive seats. And so I kind of have to sit there, right? Now, turns out, isn't this interesting, that some airports and airplanes allow people to go in two doors and others have people go in one door. In some airports and airplanes, there's a door where people go to economy class and there's another door where people go to first class. And then in other airplanes, people have to walk in the front, go through the first class and go to economy class. And because the first class people go first, as the economy class people go in, they see them. They see them sitting there in these lovely, lovely, comfortable seats as they go back to the cattle car and sit into their spot. Well, you, you may or may not know this, I think you do, but we have a problem of air rage in the last couple of years. It's a big problem. The number of incidents of violence and bad behavior on airplanes has skyrocketed. Now, some of it, I would admit, is due to the mask difficulty. Some people don't want to wear masks. But guess what? Researchers took data on air rage and how many doors in the airplane. Did people walk in and through the first class to economy class, or did they enter separately to the different classes? Guess what? When you walked by first class, to get to your seat, the incidents of air rage were significantly higher. For, wait a minute, both first class passengers and economy class passengers. When we remind people of their status, we change their behavior. When we remind people of their status, we affect how they behave at work and in school. That's the research here. So, what did I study? Status and its relationship with deviant behavior, status and its relationship with citizenship behavior. So we're operationalizing this concept. Deviant behavior means you break the rules. Deviant behavior means you do what you're not supposed to do in that situation. And citizenship behavior means you do extra to help people at work or in school, okay? Citizenship behavior would include going to meetings you're not required to go to. It would include helping people on a team project. I know in business we use team projects all the time. It might include giving somebody extra time. It might include giving somebody extra resources or attention. Deviant behavior would be not following the rules for the purpose of doing less. It might be allowing somebody else to finish your work. It might be taking resources from work and bringing them home. We call that stealing, okay? <laughs> this is deviant behavior. Okay, the theory here. The theory of social exchange theory. This is very well known and used in the social sciences. And essentially it's a theory that says when we have exchanges, there's more than money and goods going on. So, a pure economist, I suppose, if any of those ever existed, would say, you give me the money, I'll give you the goods, and we'll determine how rational that was. But of course, human beings don't behave that way. Our rationality is bounded, okay? We do things that seem irrational at the time because they make sense to us for other reasons. And so, in social exchange theory, what's going on is that more than goods and money are being changed, but also status, respect. Love, information is flowing. Money, goods are also exchanged. All this is going on at the same time. So that's what a social exchange is. It's significantly more complex than a transaction. And there are certain norms that govern a social exchange. There are a number of them. Um, six of them happen a lot in the literature, and those are the ones that we use to underpin this study. Um, but of course, it's important to note that more than one norm can apply at the same time. So what are these norms? One is reciprocity. And this means normal, healthy people, when they get something, they want to give something back. It's normal. If you're a normal, healthy person and I give you something, you want to give me something back of about the same value. 
if you just take, 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 there's something wrong with you. Right? People feel, I feel guilty. If you give, 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 and I give you nothing back, I don't feel so good. Same with you, right? Okay, second is rationality. We are generally rational creatures, and we want to get good value out of our transactions. I don't want to give you one dollar and get a half a dollar worth of stuff. I want one dollar worth of stuff, okay? We're rational that way. Third is altruism. We often feel an urge to give something where we don't get an immediate return. We often feel an urge to help somebody. This is true. All normal human beings, if they hear a child cry, feel upset. All of them, right? You hear a child cry, something's wrong, I would like to help. All normal human beings in relationships with other people occasionally like to give something for no gain. Now, of course, that you hope, perhaps, that it will come back to you in the long run. But you're not doing it for a transaction. You're doing it because it feels good to help somebody out who needed help. That's altruism. Group gain means that the, the transaction occurs where something goes into the pot for all of us. So I do something and my whole department benefits or my whole college benefits. Um, status consistency means that expectation, wait for it, that we are treated according to our appropriate level of status. Ah. Okay, I like my students to call me Steve. But I tell you what, I don't like anybody to call me Mr. McGuire. I'm sorry, you get it, right? Steve means we're buddies. Mr. means I don't recognize your degree. To me, to my mind, to my messed up head. That's how I think about it. So Steve is okay. Mr. McGuire, not so good. Not so good for me. This is status consistent. We want to be treated according to what we believe is appropriate to our status. And we feel an urge to treat others according to their status too. And finally, it's competition or rivalry where to some extent in exchanges we are competing with others. And in particular, this interacts with status because when we have high status, we want others to know it. So these norms affect the way we interact with others and they affect how we position our hypotheses. We use them to explain hypotheses of behavior. Okay. So what's the data set? Well, first, I didn't do all the work. On the handout that's on the table, if you want to pick it up, I've listed my, my co-authors. So I'm very delighted to have friends and colleagues um, in Mexico, in the Philippines, in Romania, in Russia, and of course in the United States. So my friends and colleagues uh, who eventually will be co-authors when we get this stuff out for publishing, um, they collected data. So we collected a bunch of data and we took 250 responses from each one of the countries. We collected both qualitative and quantitative data. So the qualitative data, I'm only going to show you a small sample, was students' opinions about what is status in their context. And we coded their answers and lo and behold we found three themes that correspond very nicely with what's in the literature political, economic, and uh, prestige. Now prestige had a lot to do with family and education in the sample, but I think it fits in nicely. So the qualitative data tells us that we're on the right track, that we are measuring something that does apply to students. That's important. We then collected quantitative data, so they filled out these surveys, and we took these and we tested our hypotheses with the data that we collected. Okay, hypothesis number one. Status will predict subjective well-being. So in other words, higher the status, the happier people are. Why? Because they expect to be happy. They're supposed to be happy. That's life telling them you are a high status person, therefore you deserve to be happy. You deserve pleasure. You deserve the absence of pain. Pain is for others. Pleasure is for you. You're a high status person, okay? So social exchange theory tells us that status consistency would explain why high status people would expect subjective well-being. Got it? Okay. However, status also predicts deviant behavior, as we expected, right, with the Bentleys? 
Okay, so we asked people uh, if they, uh, to what extent do you agree that you've left work for others to complete? Which is very rude at work. Not so good in a committee either, by the way. Right? Okay, if you've been in a committee, somebody leaves the work, that's terrible. And so this is deviant behavior. And the theory here, of course, is that because of rivalry and status consistency, we're going to expect high status people to demonstrate a higher level of deviant behavior. Our third hypothesis is that subjective well-being will positively predict citizenship behavior and negatively predict deviant behavior. Okay, wait a minute. And so, if people are happier in the day today, we're going to get more good behavior, we're going to get less bad behavior, partly due to reciprocity, right? If I'm nice to you, you'll be nice back to me, partly for group gain. If I do good things for the group and I'm part of the group, we'll all be better off. Hypothesis four is that subjective well-being will predict psychological well-being. Now this takes a minute to talk about. What we're saying here is that over time you accumulate day-to-day -day happiness, which together with other things like giving to charity, like helping others, results in long-term fulfillment. So it isn't that there's a separation between day-to-day -day happiness and long-term fulfillment. The day-to-day -day happiness accumulates as we go. And so this is important because we don't want to ignore the day-to-day -day happiness. There are probably some true saints in the world, in the crowd perhaps, who don't need happiness today. They're going for the long term. I'm not among them. I don't know if you are. I need a little buzz every now and then in my day to day. And that keeps me going on the good path toward long-term fulfillment. Hypothesis five is a mediation hypothesis. And what that says is that subjective well-being will explain this and it will override, if you will, the effect of status. Okay? So subjective well-being will lead to less deviant behavior, it will lead to more citizenship behavior and it will lead to greater psychological well-being regardless of the status of the person. Regardless of the status. So it's going to overcome the effect of status there. That's the hypothesis. And now the findings. So remember, we collected the data, we crunched the numbers, you have some numbers in your handout if you like to see them, and this is what we find. Finding number one. Our first hypothesis supported. Subjective well-being, in fact, was positively predicted by status. People of higher status are happier in the day today. This was found in every country. Hypothesis number two was rejected. Now this one's very interesting. In the overall sample, we did find a positive correlation. Okay, but when we broke it down to the individual countries, the findings were normally non-significant. What does that mean? Well, we cannot explain bad behavior by college-age students in college or at work because of their status. There's more going on. We haven't explained it fully. Okay, I'll take it. I have to do more research. Hypothesis three. We supported that subjective well-being would positively predict citizenship behavior and negatively predict deviant behavior. Your day-to-day -day happiness, your day-to-day -day pleasure and absence of pain leads to good behavior at work and in college. Maybe you're not surprised. I hope you're not surprised. You've experienced this stuff, right? Hypothesis four is that subjective, subjective well-being positively predicts psychological. So it accumulates. All those good days will eventually lead to your agreeing that you are fulfilled. Now, you got to combine that with other things, right? So your day-to-day -day happiness plus those other predictors of psychological well-being, like charity, like helping others. And finally, we found full mediation for the model in all countries, which you don't normally find in this kind of research. So there's something going on here, right? So these relationships are pretty strong. We have solid empirical evidence from college students about their behavior at work and in college that suggests 
that these things are on the right track. We have so much more to learn, but I think we found something. So let me try to interpret it for you, tell you what I found, and then you may have some comments for me. So some conclusions and thoughts. Number one, the importance of subjective well-being. The importance of day-to-day -day niceness, pleasure, absence of irritation and pain. Okay, this stuff matters and it matters a lot. And again, I'm a business professor where we talked about job satisfaction but never mentioned the word happiness. Where we talked about performance but never really cared how you felt about your performance in our research, in our discourse. When I was a manager, I certainly never thought, are my people happy? I thought, I was in consulting, are they billing? Are they meeting budget? Right, that's what I thought. And I don't even care if you're happy as long as you're smiling in front of the client. <laughs> Times have changed. You saw my picture, right? I got older and I got wiser, so, <laughs> or at least older. But, um, and it is therefore, I think, relevant to say that happy people behave better at work and in school. Now, you may say, I knew that before he started talking. <laughs> I had to find out the hard way, and I'm sharing that with you. Um, second, we learn and we think about that eudaimonic happiness, that long-term fulfillment, might very well be a function of a cumulative, short-term pleasure. In other words, we can't ignore the short-term. Uh, we, we, we don't simply go for a fulfilling life. We need a fulfilling life that is a consequence of many, many fulfilling days. Third, and last thought, is that subjective well-being fully mediated the relationship between behavior and status, right? In other words, we overcame status, regardless of status. And this is really important because our students and our employees, they can't control their status. They can't jump up in status. They have the status they brought with them. Now, will eventually through their life their status increase? Yes, of course. But it's not going to happen in one semester, right? It's not going to happen in one fiscal year either at work. And so we need to think about this in a way where we understand that status matters, but it's not going to be determinative of the behavior that we see. And those are my three thoughts. I want to hear yours. But I'll tell you the future research. I have a couple ideas. First, or A, what makes status more salient in 2023? I mean, 2022, I guess, but I probably won't start anything till January. <laughs> what makes it more salient? What, what are we doing to remind people of the status here? Because we know when we remind them, we're going to affect behavior, right? And I'm particularly interested in social media. What's social media doing to remind people of their status? Next, what about educators? What are we doing? to make status more sense. Should we be doing it? Should we be doing something different? What's working? What's not working? And how do we make sure that status isn't screwing up our classrooms? Because I promise you, I got 1,250 people who said they have varying degrees of status in colleges and universities around the world. Okay, it isn't, they're not, they're not the same. You can't say they're all from East LA, it's all the same status. No, I'm afraid not. There's a great variety of status among this population. B, job satisfaction, life satisfaction, overall happiness and job performance. I'd like to work with graduate students to figure out what's going on in a university. Maybe this one. I'd like to figure out the relationship between our jobs, our happiness, and our performance. I think this would be a wonderful place to have a go at it. Um, Maybe you don't. Maybe you think this would be a disaster. In addition to that, I'd like to take the students to for-profit companies and non-profit companies in the LA community, as we already do, but have a look at this topic, which I, I think companies would be interested in. I think we can make a compelling case that this matters, that this is important, and that you will benefit if we talk about it. 
So that's Cal State LA. I don't know if we'll get a go on that one or if we'll get a no on that one. But anyway, uh, people get nervous. If we figure out what's going on at Cal State LA, maybe, mm, maybe we'll take off the covers and find out there's something bad under there. Maybe we would. Or maybe we would find out what we could do so that people would actually be happier at work and get a big gain out of that. And, and finally, uh, uh, last of all, not last of all, but second to last of all, would be additional research on the predictors of <clears throat> well-being and performance in college and school. There are a number of things that, that keep coming up. One of them, uh, which we looked at in the Good Life research and was significant, is progress toward goals. When people feel they're making progress toward their goals, they generally report their life is better. And isn't that you got there? It's that you're making progress toward it. When you get there, you got to start over, you know? But when you're making progress, I'm getting there, I'm good. You, 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 feel, uh, you feel some joy. Altruism uh, as a predictor of well-being. Friendship, family life, career achievement, diverse experiences or experiences with diverse people, job satisfaction and job security. I'd like to look at these additional predictors to have a more complete model about what's affecting behavior at work and in school. There's a lot in the literature. And last slide is keep looking. Uh, we, all of us, have lots of studies ahead of us. We have lots to do, lots to fill out, right? Um, I want to keep looking. Uh, potentially, there's a colleague in Nigeria, there's a colleague in China, and there's a colleague in India that would like to participate. I think that would be wonderful additions to understanding what's going on. Um, I'm interested in the differences between for-profit and non-profit organizations. Been doing that a years, for years with my students, but not necessarily examining it directly. And I think that's interesting because this is what we know. Non-profits get away with paying a lot less. Well, how is that? How are they paying a lot less and not having a flood of people? It's where they do lose people, by the way. But it's not a flood. It's a trickle. And for-profit companies lose people too. And so there's something else going on. So I'd like to look at some of those practices. And of course, we are all interested in pedagogical practices that affect both learning and happiness. We don't want to trade off. We want our students to be challenged and to learn, and we want our students to be happy. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd love uh, comments, questions, and discussions, please. Please. I have a question. You, you said your data was collected from college students. Yes. So how could you then uh, extract the short-term happiness behavior for the long-term happiness? It looked like there was like labor in life. Right. Well, there are different constructs measured differently and are not measured longitudinally. They are measured at the same moment in time. And so you could say that calling it long-term and short-term is, is an abbreviation that doesn't help. So I can use the Greek terms eudaimonic and hedonic and maybe communicate a little bit better. Eudaimonic happiness means that I am moving toward becoming a fulfilled person. And hedonic happiness means I had a really good meal today and my friends were nice to me. And so those are the things that we measured. They're different constructs and we found that relationship. Uh, clearly, longitudinal studies are always better and always really hard to do. Um, in addition to that, as they said, they told me when I did my doctorate degree, uh, students are people too. <laughs> That's what they said because we do a lot of research with students, mostly because it's easy to get data and it's really hard to get data from other people. Um, so uh, I would suggest that long term, short term was my abbreviation rather than a suggestion that one happens later. They're both happening at the same time. One is you're becoming fulfilled and the other is you're having uh, moments of happiness in your day to day. Thank you. Um, I think I could protect my face. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, the great speech. Um, thank you. Thanks for Professor Harry for bringing me here. But I had a good question regarding as a student, um, like what would be your advice um, living in, well, this is particularly my opinion, but living in a capitalistic society where we're influenced from like monetary movements, um, how should we like configure our happiness as a student in a university? Like how would you suggest to move and sway teachers to kind of uh, make sure, like you know, students 
are towards going towards that goal that you're going for that they you know don't care that much about status but also bring in internal happiness. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I am not an anti-capitalist. As a matter of fact, I, I believe that capitalism leads to prosperity. But of course, it's been abused as we go, right? So let's not give it a, a, let's not give it a, a, a free pass. We can be critical of capitalism. But capitalism has led to prosperity. And the capitalistic societies, as you saw on the map, tend to be happier. And so capitalism has something to contribute. But there are different forms of capitalism. We studied uh, last night the window specialists in San Francisco. It's a B corporation, which means by law, it has to give some of its profit back to the community. We discussed cooperatives. There are cooperatives that make milk and cheese and things and yogurts and stuff like that. These forms of organization can coexist very nicely with a for-profit economy and they also have a perspective where part of what they do is doing good. In terms of students, I've always advised my students, work where you feel appreciated, work where you're doing something you're proud of, and guess what? You should demand that you are properly paid for the work you do. And so if they want to give you $50,000, but you're worth $80,000, you have to keep negotiating. You should not be taking $50,000 for an $80,000 gig, right? And there's somebody out there in this very big community that's going to give you 80. They're not going to give you 250. You can't buy a Bentley. But they'll give you 80. Why are you giving up so easy? Keep working. Um, we go through their resumes. We help them point out what they're good at. We encourage them to send out 70 resumes, not seven. Right? And stuff like that. So I, I, I don't know. I, I'm happy to take other voices, but I, I don't want to be the anti-capitalist in the group here at all. We can be very, very critical of the abuses of capitalism without saying, let's throw it away. What we want to do is fix it, regulate it to the extent that it needs regulation, monitor it because things that aren't monitored, of course, sometimes go awry. But I don't think we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, but do get a job you love. I did. I went from for-profit private consulting to doctoral studies, poor, to academia, half poor. I'm happy. I'm happy. Okay? Anybody else? Steve, I have a question. Is there a difference between pleasure and happiness? If there is, which one should be pursued? Because you use the word interchangeably. Where I come from, it has a difference between pleasure and happiness. Right. Pleasure is associated with sensual happiness. Sure, that sensual. Absolutely. What, 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 what I'm discovering here, what I'm discovering as I read, as I think, as I study, as I crunch my statistics, is that sensual pleasure, short term, jolts to the system, over time accumulate. And that the pursuit of that true happiness down the road is wonderful and it's what we all want. But we might not get there without some sensual pleasure on. And what's a sensual pleasure? A really good meal. The companionship of somebody you care about. Okay? Laughter. Those things that are trivial and fleeting tend to accumulate. Now, they're not all. It's not all. The fleeting, temporary, sensual pleasure is not all. We also know that altruism helps bring us up there. We also know that making progress toward our goals helps. But if I'm making progress toward my goals and I'm helping the world and I'm giving all my money to charity and I'm miserable in my day to day, I'm not going to get there. I'm not a saint. I'm going to give up. I'm going to give up. I'm going to sit at home. I'll just do Zoom for the rest of my life. <laughs> Right? Sitting there with a cup of coffee, except it's not coffee. You know what I mean, right? We've all been there. The day-to-day -day pleasure, the, 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 we, we had, my colleagues and I, we had a couple chuckles before the, 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 the session now. This makes the day-to-day -day stuff valuable and it accumulates. That's what I'm learning. I don't want to separate them. I want to see it as one is leading toward the other. But I love the question because we do care about things. My first project was The Good Life 
which is mostly on that side. Um, and the second progress is a little bit more closer to home. I'd love to hear your thoughts, though. Your thoughts about the uh, study at Cal State LA, your thoughts about what makes you happy, your thoughts about what we're doing right, anything like that would be just great. I'd be interested. As a student myself, oh, 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 okay. As a student myself, I'm wondering, after completing this project, are there any ways that you can see this research being applicable to how, you mentioned how teachers teach and they might reinforce status like, are there any ways that you can see the university or university practices changing to promote more citizen behavior? I, I, I do. I do very much so. That's just one of the points where I want to go. And I don't know that I have the answer, but I have the right question, which is what are we doing in the classroom? that's generating unhappiness? What are we doing in the classroom that's generating happiness? Okay? And I think that we could probably do the same task about three or four different ways. Okay? So for example, I can give you a presentation for 15% of your grade. And then you can come in and I can rip you apart and tell you everything you did wrong. I'm very good at that, by the way. <laughs> okay? Or I can say, Let's think of it a different way. Why don't you and your team come in and present this week? I'll rip you apart. It doesn't affect your grade. Two weeks later, you'll come back after you fix it up. You'll present and do a good job. That's a different procedure, right? And that probably applies to a whole bunch of things. There are a whole bunch of things we could probably do in a way where the learning still happens, where the honest critique still happens. We need that but where we don't make people miserable, right? What's really the point of you having a final project where you get hammered and get a bad grade and go home sad? That's not what we wanted anyway. We wanted you to learn. We wanted you to have a good grade. We're not going to give it to you. You got to earn it, but we want you to get there. And so things can change. And so some practices can change. Now, there's Dr. Cooper back there. We hammer them, right, John? We hammer them, and then they come back and they improve two weeks later, right? You can do that with reports. You can do that with papers. You can have no graded assignments, complete and complete, that get you the same place, right? I mean, honestly, what are we, bean counters, counting every single assignment for four points or five points? You did it or you didn't do it. Making a big problem for you is a, is a thing. But there are other things that make you happy. By the way, you don't know it, but when you work with a team, which is a lot of work, you're actually happier than when you did it by yourself. And sometimes you make friends, right? When I did my MBA, I studied with a couple. There was a team of four. They got married. Well. That was a pretty good team, right? <laughs> they liked working with each other so much, they decided to get married. You make friendship. You have joy. You have pleasure when we set up some assignments certain ways. And you have a whole lot less when we set it up the other way. So the question becomes, how do we get practices that lead to learning that are challenging, but also make people happy? And if we do, we're going to get a whole lot of good behavior. That's my thought. But please uh, throw in your own comment or, 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 or conclusion, if you will. Am I on the right track, or am I just talking nonsense? Actually, yeah, that is part of the reason why I was, um, I wanted to come to this presentation, because um, I did online school, and I got to see the difference between like, COVID and Zoom and an in-person school. And a question that I kind of want to answer in my own personal kind of exploration is, how can we build a stronger community with students that will lead them to not just get a good education, but like you said, develop skills, um, like important skills for life, for learning, and like socialization. Yeah. So. One, one, one. That, this is it, right? That's what we, we need to figure out. And your questions are our questions. We're asking the same questions. Some things we're learning. You take students out to the community to do a project to help somebody, to help an organization, to help a nonprofit. They're happier. The community's happier. The professors have less grading. Everyone's happy. <laughs> this stuff works. It works. They go out to Homeboy Industries and they help them figure out how to perform better so they can continue doing good. 
they're happier, homeboys is happier, I'm happier because I have less grade. It's all good. And so, yeah, this is what we have to do. Performing and acting helps. One of my students in business did entertainment business with the arts people. They made a movie. She's walking around on a cloud. This is so much better than selling shampoo, <laughs> right? We made a movie. I'm marketing the movie so people come and see this movie. It's a fabulous movie challenging all kinds of uh, stereotypes and norms. Uh, I didn't understand half the movie, but that's okay. She did the marketing for the movie. It was wonderful. Having experiences like that, you learn as much, I think. You're challenged as much, I think. And along the way, what a ride. What a rush. There are, there are things we can design that way. But it's not, it just doesn't happen. We have to stop and think about it, right? We gotta stop and think, hmm, what am I doing that's not working? What am I doing that makes people happy? What am I doing that makes people miserable? I teach, believe it or not, statistics in a research methods class. Cynthia has a very bad reputation. Okay, people, oh, I hate statistics. And I'm trying my hardest to have really cool assignments. So the students learn the statistic doing something where they solve a problem and they feel good about it. And they're allowed to work with their neighbors. Because you don't remember what that thing was. So you ask your neighbor, and maybe your neighbor remembers. Probably not, but could be. Or maybe your neighbor's good at Google. Google stuff real fast. Um, it's a challenge. But that doesn't excuse us for trying to do it. We have to try to do it. And you know, we walk around, we do in, in uh, all departments, right? We observe people. We have to observe them, write their reports. You go into some class, you say, wow, this was great. You go into the class, you say, what a snooze. And we need to learn from that. And it, I think it's less about the charm of the instructor than it is about the design of the experience. Well, how is the experience designed? If you have 50 minutes of blah, blah, and then you go to work on your table with your team members, this is so much more better than 30 minutes of blah, blah. Just to start, and, and things like that. And so I, I don't think it's a trade-off. I think we can maximize learning and maximize happiness, and the result will be better behavior. Does that mean we're done? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.